Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our 15th anniversary of the 11 Days of Global Unity. I'm Karen Palmer. I'm going to be one of your hosts here for our summit. As you're coming in, um, just type in the chat where you're watching from and let us know. We'd love to just give you a shout out and invite you into our beautiful global family. Um, if you're new to the um, WE campaign, you can go to facebook.com forward slash the WE campaign and you'll get notifications whenever we're live. Um, also, if you could share this broadcast, you just click on that little button that says share. And when you click on that button that says share, it'll go to your timeline or you can share it to any groups or you can share it to any pages that you manage. You're going to want to share this. This is an incredible, incredible show. We have a wonderful guest and an incredible co-host, my, my dear friend, Mr. Rick Ulfick, who is the founder of We the World and the We Campaign at we.net. He is also the co-creator of the 11 Days of Global Unity, 11 Campaigns to Transform the World, a global platform that unites and amplifies the efforts of people, organizations, movements working for the common good with participants that have included Desmond Tutu, Jane Goodall, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Bill McKibben, and many more. Welcome, Rick. Oh, it's great to be on with you, Karen, as, as always. This is so exciting. Uh, let's tell folks about you. Our host is Karen Palmer, a mom who made a wish that sparked a kindness revolution. She is a global kindness leader and educator at globalkindnesstv.org. And she is a live stream and social media expert, a best-selling author, and she co-produces several popular online talk shows, in, including We The World's monthly show called The Welcome to We Show. Thank you, Karen, and thank you all so much for joining us today. We encourage you to check out all of our panels of this 11 Days of Global Unity Telesummit on the 11 Campaigns for Change. Together, we believe these 11 themes and these 11 campaigns form a blueprint for global transformation. Today, we will be talking about economic justice with Hazel Henderson, who was one of the honorary co-chairs of the launch of 11 Days of Global Unity 15 years ago, along with Jane Goodall, Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, Rian Eisler, and so many others. Well, Looking at the big picture, in my opinion, economic inequality is connected to many or maybe most of the challenges humanity is facing. In 2013, the wealth of just the top 80 people worldwide was equal to the bottom three and a half billion people. According to a recent Oxfam report, Last year, that number was only 26 people whose wealth equals that of half of humanity. The, the Panama Papers, followed by the Paradise Papers, highlighted how 20 to $32 trillion is being sheltered from taxation in offshore accounts, while many governments have had to cut back on social services, often leading to widespread widespread discontent and political upheaval. As wealth and power continues to be concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, record amounts of money are flowing into politics, often influencing politicians to serve special interests. As a result, people in the US and elsewhere are expressing strong social and political frustration about their economic insecurity as well as reduced public services, crumbling infrastructure, no ma major jobs programs, inadequate investment in education and increasing env environmental problems, including pollution, and of course, climate disruption. Poor people, 
especially people of color, are often feeling the worst effects of this. For example, not being able to pay $500 for bail, even if they are totally innocent of an accused crime. And, and you know, our jails are filled with people like in that situation. And, and some politicians are falsely blaming immigrants, refugees, and particular ethnic and religious or national groups for society's economic and social problems, which is fueling intolerance, xenophobia, and militarism. Well, I'm really on my soapbox today, right? So um, more, more than half of public school students in the United States live in poverty, according to the National Center for Education S Statistics. And yet we are hearing that in the United States, uh, people aren't doing too badly. Uh, you know, we're at record low um, unemployment rates and people's salaries are incre increasing. So to discuss economic justice and make sense of some of these contradictions and talk about her work with ethical markets, we are so excited to be joined by Hazel Henderson. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Hazel Henderson is the founder and president of Ethical Markets Media at ethicalmarkets.com, the creator and co-executive producer of its TV series. She is the author of Mapping the Global Transition to the Solar Age and co-creator of the Green Transition Scoreboard Report well known for the Calvert Henderson quality of life indicators, Hazel is a world renowned futurist, evolutionary economist, worldwide syndicated columnist, consultant on sustainable development. And she is the author of many books, including the Axiom and Nautilus award-winning book, Ethical Markets, Growing the Green Economy. Welcome to the 11 Days of Global Unity Telesummit, Hazel Henderson. Hello, Rick. Thank you so much. You're such a hero in my book. Well, thank <laughs> I just you. can't believe how you have stuck with all of this stuff for so long. And uh, so am I. You know, um, I began as an environmental activist before you were born, actually, uh, in New York <laughs> City. I started a group called Citizens for Clean Air. I mean, come on, you know? And so basically I turned into a sort of a myth buster. And uh, I began to realize that all of the statistics that were driving our society, you know, were, were based on money and money is not wealth. Money is just information which, if it's designed properly, can track real wealth. And the real wealth is human beings creatively interacting with the natural resources of this planet in such a way as to create quality, not quantity, quality of life. And so what I have been preaching uh, for 40 years, really, is that we live on an abundant planet and it is powered every day by those free photons from our mother star, the sun. The sun's not going to run out anytime soon and we can shift to a solar based economy, uh, certainly uh, by 2030, but a lot sooner, actually. And for six years, I was a policy wonk in Washington at the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Engineering and all that. And uh, our members are all science, scientists, really Nobel Prize winners. And they agreed that the US economy could have been completely run on solar, wind, energy efficiency, all of the renewable technologies by 1975, if we had subsidized 
solar and wind and energy efficiency to the same degree that we subsidize fossil fuels and nuclear power and um, all of you know those military applications. So basically what we need to understand is that uh, this abundance um, is available to all of us by just changing uh, the rules. And the economic textbooks really are all based on the idea of scarcity. And they control the scarcity by the myths of the money supply, the myths of GDP, the myths of all of those statistics that the mainstream financial media report to us without thinking every day, without asking the question, well, what does this really measure, this GDP? What does it really measure? Oh, I see, it only measures money transactions. It doesn't measure all the things that Senator Robert Kennedy talked about. It doesn't, uh, men, it doesn't measure all the things that really make life worthwhile. Well, you know, you were a, a pioneer in, in uh, breaking that myth or busting that myth uh, when you drew the uh, distinction between uh, the GDP or the GNP as it used well, to be, people, I think, yeah. right? Um, and, um, and, what, and quality of life, what, you know, the, the old story of, you know, two people get a divorce and everybody's horrified, you know, but they, but they both, you know, go out and they get uh, lawyers, they hire lawyers and they both get separate apartments. So the, the gross domestic uh, product goes up, goes up. but, yeah. but the actually uh, quality of people's lives goes, goes down, down. And, and nothing's yeah. measuring that when yes. people get divorced or, or if they're, you know, all the all these other things. So you were a pioneer in in bringing that to the world, and and we all thank you. And we we say, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. <laughs> oh, Jason oh, so Henderson well, for bringing that to the world. Well, you, you know, when I started Citizens for Clean Air, and we went to Robert Kennedy, who was then running for Senate out of New York, and we took him on a helicopter ride around New York to show him all of the pollution coming out of the smokestacks and coming out of all of the individual incinerators all over the city. And we said, look, um, our program here at Citizens for Clean Air is to change the GNP, GDP, um, which is just about money, and uh, we want to subtract from the money indicators um, all of the bads, um, and the bads are pollution and ill health, and we were worried about all the children um, who were inhaling lead from the automobile exhaust and all of that. And so uh, we said that um, the GDP should be corrected. And if you subtracted all the bads created, you know, not to mention, you know, toxic water and all of the pollution effects that we're dealing with today, including of course, climate change, um, that we haven't been making any progress at all. And so, uh, Fast forward many, many years um, when I joined the advisory council of the Calvert Group of Socially Responsible uh, Mutual Funds in 1982, they asked me to help devise uh, new scorecards for companies, you know, looking at the bads and were they really subtracting the bads from the goods on their balance sheet so we could really see what was happening. And so basically, um, we uh, launched the Calvert Henderson Quality of Life Indicators in 2000. We were the first asset manager to do such a thing, you know. And of course, um, we were met with total, total disbelief by all of the mainstream media. Nobody would touch it. And, and they would say, well, you know, um, we get the GDP numbers from uh, the, the, the Department of Commerce and, you know, uh, we can't take, we can't change uh, this, you know. And so here we are 20 years later, and finally we are beginning to see these bads every day and realize 
what I was saying back then, and I remember being invited by all of these um, religious groups, um, the Catholics, uh, the Presbyterians, the uh, universal Unitarian groups, and the Baha'is, and they would invite me to speak to their annual meetings. And I kept on saying, well, you know, I don't belong to any one of these organized religions. Um, I I'm just a human being trying to figure out what's going on <laughs> on this planet, you know. And I hang out with people from all religious persuasions, you know, Buddhists, and who na you name it. But basically, all I'm really saying is that if we run our societies as we have been doing it since the globalization of this GDP model went all over the world, we called it financialization of this money model, uh, it was like flying over the countries at 50,000 feet. You were missing all of the people on the real people in the real economy in the middle of countries that didn't go to Davos and that didn't fly in private jets, um, were nothing to do with Wall Street, didn't even have a 401k, um, were just basically left behind. And so basically, um, I, I, I was saying to them, we're running our societies on the seven deadly sins. My God, that was what they wanted me to talk about. Every one of the religious traditions wanted me to talk about how the economic model based on money, which is a myth, nothing to do with real wealth, and that based on the seven deadly sins that in economic textbooks tell us are the most important things. Self-interest, greed, competition, accumulation of capital, um, all of that kind of stuff, conflict, a scarcity, fear. Um, and, and I said, why don't we just go back to what all of the religious traditions in the world have always said? Let's run on the golden rule. What's wrong with the golden rule? And that was what they wanted me to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> sure, exactly. You know, what you were saying before about how the, the calculation of, of what is hurting society is not part of the financial equation, you know, when, when you're talking about profits, um, I guess we call that externalities, right? And internalized costs. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. so um, if you were going to, or if we were going to assess the ex externalized costs of uh, of companies like Exxon Mobil and Chevron and all of the the oil companies that became the largest companies in the world, I mean, uh, of all time in all history, they became that large. But but we didn't count what was being put into the air by those companies because they didn't have to subtract that from their profit margins. That's right? exactly they, right, Rick. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, the cost of the health of, of humanity, um, you know, the World Health Organization last year came out with a report that said uh, 7 million people die prematurely from air pollution every right. year. Um, in, the, in the United States alone, it's it's up around 90,000 people. It's like over 200 people a day. And all the children who are dying from asthma, asthma and the elders. So those costs are not subtracted and they're not paid for by these companies that are dumping this. And then, and of course, we're not even talking about climate change and all the, all the costs of climate change with the fires and the droughts and the yeah, floods exactly. and... Exactly. And and all of the different things, the sea level rise, how much would those companies be making if the the costs of what they're, you know, their costs to 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 run their businesses were, well, were deducted? Well, basically, they'd all be out of business. And what happened um, many years ago, actually about five years ago, um, the United Nations did a study of this with a group that we work with in Britain called True Cost that had been looking at that other side of the balance sheet, the bads, 
um, you know, um, that, that came along with the goods. Because, of course, there were goods, you know. Um, there was air conditioning, you know, and uh, mobility and all kinds of things that we wanted um, and that were advertised very heavily, you know. Um, and But nobody talked about the bads. And so, actually, when that study came out, um, they found that all of the profits that were recorded on the balance sheets of all of these uh, fossilized, fossil-related companies um, would have been negative. In other words, if they'd had to pay the costs that were mounting every year, and now, of course, the costs are way out of you know, the range now of any private corporation, they have to now go to the government to get bailed out by us, the taxpayers. That was what happened in 2008, that they had the power over the legislatures who believe in the money game and took all this money from Wall Street. And so they got bailed out, nobody went to jail, but ordinary people lost their homes, yeah. lost their livelihoods, lost their 401ks, lost everything, lost their jobs. And so this, are all is coming up to real time now. And what's so um, heartening to me as a grandmother is to see uh, Greta Thunberg and all of these wonderful, wonderful, brilliant school children uh, saying with great articulation, uh, enough, enough is enough. The future is ours. We are changing the game from the seven deadly sins, winning, to the golden rule with good behavior and respect and love and love for the planet um, is going to be the new rule book. And this is the only way that humanity will survive. We're on the sixth great extinction. And we have to understand as part of the biosphere, reliant on plants who take the sun's rays and with the first technology invented by the, the biosphere on this planet was photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. It was invented by plants wow. uh, and their green cells learned how to capture those photons that were coming from the sun and turn Phot it- Photons, right. Yes, and they turned it into carbohydrates which is the basis of our food supply. We would all be gone. So the point is that we are the next species going to go extinct if we don't change to the new rule book. And so what we do at Ethical Markets Media, see, I never thought I would have to start a media company, but after we brought out in the year 2000, after we brought out the quality of life indicators and realized that the mainstream media that got all of their advertising from the fossilized sectors, we realized, okay, we have to start an internet-based platform um, of lateral communications where we link with people like you and all of the wonderful people like Karen all over the world um, who are connecting with each other directly. And this lateral new media, new media um, is going to finally, I think, turn the old media around. Look at Time Magazine this week. We turned Time Magazine around. We can maybe turn a few of the others around. What, what did Time Magazine have to say? Well, they're saying in this current issue, they remind us that they did do an issue on the endangered planet mm -hmm. back in the 1970s. And I was at the World Watch Institute in those days with Lester Brown and everybody in Washington, all the policy wonks and the politicians called Lester Brown, Dr. Doom and wouldn't take anything that we were writing about seriously. But Time Magazine did catch on and uh, did give Al Gore um, a platform. Um, but, you know, there was such an overriding power 
um, from the fossil fuel sectors in those days that they couldn't break through. But this issue this week, the Time magazine says, okay, you know, uh, we are going to, from now on, um, report the truth of what's happening on this planet, uh, come what may, even if they lose fossil fuel advertisers. Oh, that's a very Im impressive. Well, there is this divestment campaign going on to get more and more, uh, even cities and uh, municipalities are divesting from fossil fuels. Yes, and we track that. You see, we track um, all of the fossil free portfolios that are successful. We track all of the green technologies, the solar, the wind, energy efficiency, LED lighting, um, electric uh, vehicles, um, solar-based electric chargers, you, where you're not having to go into the grid and use dirty fossilized electricity because that defeats the whole purpose of having an electric car. And so um, th these are solar powered um, electric vehicle chargers, which mean you don't have to worry about innovating batteries. The battery you have is fine. We can retrofit um, all of the gas cars to run uh, on electric. Th this is what Prince um, Harry and Meghan Markle did. They showed that um, to the elite in Britain that you could take a, um, a car, a gas car, and put an electric engine in it. You don't have to throw away your car. Just take the old gas guzzler and put an electric engine in it. They're, they're talking a lot about um, Greta having the Greta effect in the in Europe also by having um, more more and more people are now taking trains and public transportation and people are, and and really um, you know there's so many organizations that are helping us to see that one person does make a difference and that we really need to think about how can we, each of us be, you know, part of the solution and not just a flashlight pointing on all the problems. You know, Hazel, what would you say um, for somebody who is, I, and another thing is we're, you know, we have the compassionate cities with the Charter for Compassion. Yes. I would love to reach out and I'm one of the spokespeople for the Charter for Compassion's um, Compassionate California. And we're, we're gonna be the first state that is going to be a compassionate state here in the United States. Oh, and it would be great. great to have this as like a model and take it as a prototype to each of our little cities that because my little city here, I have a great relationship with my mayor and my city council. So what would you say to somebody who's just sitting here watching and they say, I have a city, I, I'd like to learn more about how I can get involved. What would you say to them? Well, first of all, congratulations, Karen. We'd like to put you on our site as one of our partners. What we are really, um, we are a global network of networks um, um, of the green economy. And everything we do from all over the world, we have 30,000 uh, professionals. Many of them are green investors all over the world. And they send me the good news every day. I get about 500 emails in my box every morning. And it's about the good news of the green economy. We do not to need to invent anything else. Um, what we need to do, and a lot of people are doing this now, as the people like you, who are, are really promoting the golden rule economy, which is going to save us. This is true. Um, so uh, look on our partners page. Um, we are partners with the World Academy of Art and Science and so many, the World Business Academy, so many organizations. Um, and our television programs are called Transforming Finance. And they are interviews and you can usually just go on our website to access them. And it's just me having conversations with pioneer asset managers who've created fossil free portfolios with all of these new technologies. And the big winners right now uh, that everybody can do is that they can for their own health um, shift to plant-based foods and beverages. 
And the companies that are involved in these plant-based foods and beverages are the next big thing. And, um, and if you go on ethicalmarkets.com, our green transition scoreboard, um, they, we have about 20 companies we're watching. And many of them are going on the stock exchange now, like Beyond Meat, but there's a whole lot more of them. And basically, if we all uh, buy our food the way I do, I I've been a vegetarian for about 30 years. Um, I attribute my good health to being a vegetarian. And um, the David Cameron is coming out with a new film. Um, we've put the trailer, I think we've put the trailer up on our site, but he, uh, it's called a Game Changers. And he's interviewing all of these incredible athletes in all kinds of different, you know, Olympian winners. And every one of them is a vegetarian. And, uh, and so there's this big beefy guy, you know, um, that's doing an interview uh, in the trailer and somebody is saying, well, my gosh, how can you possibly ever be as strong as an ox? Um, only on eating plants. And he turns around and flexes his muscles and says, have you ever watched an ox eating? It's eating <laughs> plants. Good point. Good point. That's so everybody great. can do that for their own health. And also um, the livestock, the raising of livestock, all over the world is what's causing the fires in the Amazon right now. They're turning the land into pasture for cattle to feed McDonald's and all of these uh, meat producers. And the soy that they're growing is for animal feed. So the uh, meat-based um, food now and diets uh, is creating um, 15 percent of all the greenhouse gases and is causing the destruction of forest land which is turned into this land for raising uh, livestock mostly the problem is uh, is uh, cattle and sheep and goats they yeah, they we've known are, that for a long time and people are just it's just starting to hit the media, it feels yes. like. Yeah. I mean, I studied that in environmental education when I was going to school and learned okay. that that was, that was going on and started, you know, when I designed my board game, that's, um, that was one of the questions, you know, how can we help the Amazon rainforest is to buy products that are being made from there and not go to any fast food restaurants because yes. all fast food restaurants are getting, that's what they're, they're doing. And we, we here can make a big difference if we just boycott, boycott that. Well, you know what's happening now at the financial level, which shows that you're absolutely right, Karen, and you've been a pioneer on this, um, is that there is now a group of investors, big, big investors all over the world who've gotten together and from Asia, North America, Latin America, and um, they are investing in plant-based food and beverages, all these new companies, but they are also uh, shorting, we call this um, selling down, mm -hmm. um, 16 of the world's biggest meat producers. So what they're saying now is that the, right now we all know that fossil fossilized assets are what's called stranded assets. Mm -hmm. uh, don't buy them. Try to get out of them. Try to shift to green uh, green companies before they lose these companies lose their value. That's called stranded fossil assets. Right. And we know we cannot raise any more of the fossils out of the ground without cooking the planet. That's we got that. Even the even the toughest um, um, money types in uh, in the fi financial markets now know. Oh, okay, uh, we have to try and get out of fossilized assets from the 19th century. All of those companies and get into the 21st century companies, 
which are all of solar, wind, energy efficiency, LED lighting, you know, electric cars. There's but a question the here, thing... if, if I could just interrupt you for just one minute. There's a question that came up that from our audience. Thank you, Carolyn Cords. Um, and yes, I, I'm grateful that you're in California and that you're going to reach out and, and get involved. That's awesome. Um, she's asking, should we invest in new green companies like stock? Is that is that like is that a helpful thing for us to that's do? That's what that's what I'm saying. Not only to disinvest from all the food, the meat producers. So there's this 16 meat producers that everybody is going to start disinvesting um, in the meat producers and shifting the investment now into the plant based foods and beverages. So in exactly the same way, um, uh, we have been tracking investors who have shifted from fossil fuels over the past 10 years to solar, wind, energy efficiency, all of these. And uh, we have been tracking them in our green transition scoreboard. And we started off in 2009, taking wow. it to the climate change conference in Copenhagen, wow. which was a train wreck. You know, they were all arguing and fighting about who was to naming, blaming, and shaming. And we said, hey, look, while you're doing all of this, we track $1.2 trillion already invested in solar, wind, energy efficiency, uh, electric buses, all of these new technologies. And why don't you guys just go, just go shift your investments? And now our cumulative title, we've been following this every year since then. And our newest study, which is on our website, it's a free download, at Green Transition Scoreboard, right there on ethicalmarkets.com. And our new number, we break it down so they can see all the companies they could invest in. The new number is uh, 10.387 trillion of private investors, people like me and you, who can invest now in all of these new clean, green companies. And you can do it at the local level uh, through community um, development, bonds, all kinds of things now that are happening at the community level. You can crowdfund your projects uh, at the local level, or you can do what they do at the Schumacher Society in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where they created their own local currency uh, called the Berkshires. And they have now two currencies. And in one pocket, they have US dollars if you have to go outside of your community to buy something which is not produced locally. But in the other pocket, you have Berkshires. And every one of their local banks takes Berkshires. Wow, and they really have funded yeah. they have funded restaurants, they have funded community agriculture, they funded co-housing. So go to the Schumacher uh, Center for New Economics. And or you can just come to our site and we'll introduce you to them from there. Yeah, I put, put that in. I put that in the chat. So yeah. anybody who that's wants a working to learn more, you can go to yeah. ethicalmarkets.com. I just yes. put that into the chat. Yeah. And anybody uh, can go there and we can point them in the direction of models like uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Can you talk is, about some of the advantages of using a local currency? Like there's no, there's, there's no uh, interest on debts and things like that. What, what are the aspects of a local currency that you could talk like about? The, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. I, oh I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, local currencies, there are hundreds and hundreds of local currencies all around the world um, where people realized, oh, okay, if the big croupier at our central bank isn't providing us with enough chips to play the game, um, we'll create our own chips and create the game locally, you see? So yeah. everybody understood, oh, I see money has nothing to do with wealth. We can create our own money. And so all of these, uh, you, you can go to well, our website. We have a program there, a TV program you can watch. And it was a special that we produced on PBS uh, twice. We uplinked it ourselves. We couldn't get through their thought police at the local, you know, at the big 
PBS, that they have all of the old economy in charge. But we got um, uh, that out there and it's called The Money Fix. And it's a one hour special and you can find it and click on it and watch it. And the first half of it is all about the politics of money creation and how it fell into the hands of the private banks. In the constitution, it says that the uh, treasury the U.S. Treasury is supposed to create the money supply directly. We don't have to pay interest to bondholders, and we don't have to allow private banks to create our currency the way they do today. They just, they just create our money out of thin air. If you go to a bank um, and say, oh, I want a mortgage to buy a house, uh, and they say, okay, well, you know, how much do you need? Okay, I need $100,000. They write into your account $100,000, and then that becomes money. But it's crazy. You see, it's absolutely crazy. And so how all of this now is becoming uh, in the public awareness is through local currencies. And the second half of the show um, talks about all of the local currencies and how they're teaching people that you can do it in your own community. And the, what all a local currency needs is a compassionate community and, um, and a strong um, civic society. Of voluntary groups. See, I started off writing about the love economy, and that's the 50% of all economic activity which is unpaid. And in every society, there's a set of rules that says what activities are going to be paid for and what activities are supposed to be done for love as volunteers. And guess who has to have all of the unpaid love activities? Women. Women. Raising children, serving on the school board, all of that local stuff. And so women have gone along with this for the longest time. And if you look in the economic textbooks, it says that unpaid work is non-economic. So women's work, which we now know is about 11 trillion of annual GDP, global GDP, is simply missing from the statistic. That's how much richer we are than we even know, because we don't count um, all of the unpaid wealth creation uh, in the communities, mostly done. You know, there are some societies, um, you know, about five trillion annually um, is, uh, is unpaid work done by men, by our dear brothers who have built houses, built schools, um, created roads. So this 16 trillion, which was first measured by the United Nations in um, 1995, and I was there at the UNDP, uh, and it was put on the Human Development Report, the Human Development Index, and they said, my God, the 16 trillion simply missing from the annual GDP of that year, which was tw uh, 24 trillion in money terms. And so it would have been 40 trillion if those 60, if, if all of those people had been paid, but they were the love economy. So what we're saying now is the love economy is going to rule. Exactly. Not the money economy, it's the love economy. You know, um, it's so interesting that we're talking about this. In 1999, I went to the Parliament of the World's Religions in, in, Cape, in Cape Town in, in South Africa. And, um, you know, that's, uh, we the world had a, a couple of uh, workshops there and we got to uh, give an, a nonviolence award to Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And uh, we met the uh, Dalai Lama there as well. But yeah. um, so we went out into the township of, of uh, Cape Town. It's like this vast area that looks like an ocean of shacks. It's like the shanty town of, yeah. uh, of uh, Cape, Cape Town. And guess what? They had a local economy in there. First of, of all, they took us in, they gave us food and everything, but they were exchanging these, these notes, which were based on, um, 
the amount of time that they were doing things. And um, yeah. I, I, I remember there's something called Ithaca Hours yes. in, in, um, in New York, yes. uh, which is also based on time. It's a currency Absolutely. based on time. Yes. And, uh, and the, the, the guy who invented Ithaca Hours then went to Philadelphia and tried to start a health uh, cooperative, the uh, same kind of thing. Um, Paul, oh my gosh, uh, it's just, I'm missing his last name at the moment, but anyway, Paul Glover. Paul Glover is uh, the hero of that, you know? And so, yeah, these local currencies are everywhere. And I've done a lot of work in Brazil. I used to teach at a business school in Sao Paulo. And uh, I remember um, finding out that there were all these local currencies in Brazilian towns um, all, all over the place. And uh, after Lula came in, uh, basically they realized, well, look, um, we don't need to burden the local, the, the real, the, the official real. Uh, uh, let's, let's just allow these people and, and validate their local currencies. So the local currencies became legal. And so a lot of these towns were able to close their own needs and put together, match their own unemployed people with the needs that they need, that they had. And, you know, the city of Curitiba in Brazil um, was the leader in this and, and because their mayor um, understood that, my gosh, if we have all of these uh, unemployed youth running around um, and if they pick up the garbage and if they help to keep the parks clean, um, we'll let them ride the city buses free. We'll give them city bus passes. And so they created um, a local economy there with local currency right there in Curitiba. And that's a city of about, my God, several million people. So, you see, this is, this is the problem with the mainstream media. You see, they're all tied to the past, and all their advertising comes from the fossilized sectors of these incumbent 19th century industries, you know, like um, gasoline-based automobiles and all, all that stuff, which is now history. And all of the new stuff um, requires the new media, like what we're doing today. And the thing is that what we did, um, we just sort of invited all of these networks uh, from around the world um, who are living examples of this, like the New Economics Foundation in London, and we work with them. And uh, there is a, a group um, which I think is the only cryptocurrency which will really survive. See, Bitcoin, I call it Bitcoin. <laughs> it's just basically greed. It's greed and speculation. And people who are afraid, you know. Um, this is why people are running to gold. They're afraid. Didn't they know that King Midas ended up where he couldn't eat the gold and there was no fresh water to drink? You know, come on. I mean, we don't have to go back uh, to those kind of barbaric, um, simplistic, sort of, uh, you know, ways of dealing with this, we go forward and say, look, we're in the information age. And it, the inf when I give you, or you give me information, Rick, um, you still have it. I have it and you have it. That's the abundance. See, this is the age of abundance. The free photons and information isn't scarce. We can all grow. And that's what's happening with this local media, like we're doing today. We are expanding human understanding of our true condition on this planet. And that's this is all about science. And I, I'm talking now with Wall Street groups about going to science-based investing from their old model, which is money making money. That's magical thinking. We can't oh, there's have a lot of magical thinking going yeah. on with, with the, the corporations are buying back their own shares yeah, instead of investing in new uh, uh, yeah. products and, and, and their 
their uh, workers and everything. Oh, yes. I mean, it's a huge bubble. All these derivatives, you know, the funds and funds of funds and pyramiding assets. This is what happened in 1929, just before the Wall Street crash. You know, is this is magical thinking. So, so that brings me to write a book about the love economy. I would love to, I would love to read the love economy book that, uh, do you uh, have oh. information on that? Well, no, yeah, you can, it's it, my dear Karen, yes. thank you. It's online and it's free. Yeah. Just read it. Right on your website? It's right on my website. It's called oh. Creating Alternative Futures, The End of Economics. Wonderful. Wow. So, so that brings me to a question. You know, some people believe that we may not be able to prevent cli the climate crisis and the mass extinction of species from becoming irreversible by 2030 unless we find an alternative to capitalism. People feel that if capitalism continues as it is, as the dominant economic system, then we will not be able to turn this around. What do you think about that? Well, I'm thinking of those two labels. You see, we fought a Cold War over two memes, capitalism and communism. You remember? And millions of people died over those two memes. And when the Green Party started in Germany, I, I, was, uh, I went over there as one of the supporters and advisors of the Green Party. And you know what their slogan was? We are neither left nor right. We are ahead. And you see, um, I've been talking with some of the advisors to the Green New Deal here in this country, which is a no-brainer. And I've been saying, <laughs> I hope you could use the same thing, you know, that it, the left and right, that was the last century. And, yeah. and basically, let's get out of all of the stupid words. The point is that money was a very useful invention. And uh, when it's created locally and at all levels, we don't have to have just one sort of money that's national money that's traded on stock exchanges and all of that kind of thing. That's the old system. We can have local money. Uh, there's dozens and dozens of forms of exchange. What we're talking about is exchange and trading. Humans have always been traders and they sometimes exchange shells and sometimes they exchange want wampum uh, like my Navajo friends. See, I have two wonderful gifts from the Navajo uh, country. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we can exchange with each other. I mean, even we have a local radio program here. We're an agricultural area of Florida. You may not think so, but we are. And with, there's a local radio station where farmers call up and they say, um, I need um, pepper seeds um, uh, for, for the next round. And um, who has, uh, I can let you have um, a couple of days on my tractor. And they give their phone number. And then somebody calls in and says, oh, okay, great. You know, let's make a deal. Then they go offline and get together. That's a money system. They're creating an information age currency. You see, and so there is only one crypto currency which I think may survive. That I've looked at them all, they're all now traded on these stupid stock exchanges, you know, Coinbase and stuff like that. All nonsense, it's all about speculation. But there is one um, which is called Solar Coin, and I got really interested in that. And I met the guy who founded it, and um, Nick Gogarty. And he came out of Wall Street and decided, look, you know, this is all a bunch of nonsense. So he went back to Columbia University and got a degree in biology. And then he wrote a book called The Nature of Value. And that book was published by um, Columbia University Press and, um, in, in 2012. And he points out that currencies are always information-based social protocols. And they, their prices fluctuate 
to the extent of the size of the platform they're on and the number of people who use that currency and believe in it. So SolarCoin, he invented SolarCoin as kind of an experiment. And this is like a rewards currency that you would get for airline, like airline miles. And you can claim your solar coins wherever you are, my dear friends, all over the world. Go to solarcoin.org. And if you can demonstrate with a third-party verifier uh, that you are capturing photons from the sun um, for your local electros electricity needs, if you've got a solar panel on your roof, or if you're in a village in Africa, uh, in some African country, and you're, you've got a, a, a solar group there. Many of them are doing this now, microgrids in many, many African countries, because they are never going to be able to afford a nuclear power plant. It takes 10 years to build. It's crazy. Um, so you can claim your solar coins, and um, uh, depending on how many kilowatt hours of solar electricity you can prove that you're using. So take a look, go to solarcoin.org. It's a foundation and it's run out of Connecticut. And, um, and I know uh, Nick Gogarty, I'll be, you should do a program with him. Well, you know, um, along with coalition building, We the World and the We Campaign are working to spark a cultural shift towards we consciousness and the common good so mm -hmm. it is normal in society that the needs and well-being of all are valued and prioritized at the highest levels of government and industry. So a question, my question for you is, do we need to achieve such a culture of uh, we consciousness and the common good in order to end the catastrophic economic inequality that we've seen and all the cascading effects of that that we've been talking about? And what are the role of movements in creating change? What was the role of? Movements. Movements. Movements are key now. You see, uh, I learned that um, as an early member of the environmental movement. We were all ridiculed. We began in each other's living rooms, you know, with babysitters. And um, we were ridiculed. Um, and then um, there was the women's movement began the same way. We were ridiculed. Um, most of my life um, where I have uh, spent the time uh, to understand what was happening on this planet and what we could actually do to shift to a really sustainable way of creating quality for everybody. Um, uh, it, it's been like um, a psychological burden for me <laughs> because, you know, um, I never went to college. And that's amazing. You could be. You are kidding me. You <laughs> are kidding me. No, I mean, I have four PhDs, but they were all <laughs> awarded to me. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Wow. So, you see. I didn't realize what I was doing was self-empowering myself. And I was doing it just because um, you'll read in my book, Creating Alternative Futures, I start off by saying, um, I feel like an extraterrestrial. Uh, here I'm, I am. In your, I'm in your club. I'm in your <laughs> and, and I, I feel that way too. You know, um, <laughs> am, I, am I part Creating of Creating our own little planet. Right. Right. And families and, don't understand it either. <laughs> right. And so the point is, yes, we are. But the thing is that we have moved from this, from the level, yeah. the, the evolutionary level, where we were driven by our amygdala, our reptilian brain. Yeah. It was all fight or flight. You know, this this was millions of years of our early history you know, where we had to be worried about animals and we had to, you know, and the guys went out and, and um, you know, killed some animal and all of that. And the women um, were supposed to raise the kids. And of course, nobody else would have raised them if the women didn't do it. And so we have now emerged uh, from all of that past evolutionary development to the forebrain. We are 
are now um, a human species with a very, very highly developed forebrain, which allows us to look into the future, allows us the kind of rational thought where we honor our emotions and everything from the amygdala, but we understand that's part of our early development. And now we have to move forward and understand that we're just a human species which has been wildly successful. We have colonized every corner of this planet and we have caused the demise of many, many other species on the way. But now we're all in this together. And in this round, um, if uh, we will go extinct just the way all the others do, unless we understand the new science. Uh, and the new science, luckily, um, and this is kind of odd, but um, NASA has been a great help to me. Um, I, I was very much opposed to going to Mars and all of this. I'm saying, no, 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 we don't have time to do that. Um, and the first um, astronaut in space, um, Sally Ride, the first woman astronaut in space, she came back in the 1980s and said, oh my God, we don't need a mission to another planet. We need a mission to planet Earth. Mm -hmm. and she began the Earth System Science Program at, La at NASA. And the scientists that we work with um, is really taking the information from 120 Earth observing satellites, not just from NASA, but the European space program, the space program from all over the world, from Japan and China and uh, from Latin America. And they are telling us the conditions on this planet on a daily basis, how the climate is changing, how the oceans are warming, where we need to pay attention. Um, and so um, I uh, wrote a book, which, uh, which this guy, um, Dennis Bushnell, who's the chief scientist at NASA at Langley, Virginia, that overlooks this program. And to my amazement, he did the foreword to my book, which came out um, in London uh, called Mapping the Global Transition to the Solar Age, which is where we are now. And he did the foreword. And right now, we are good friends. We've done six television programs together about the future of AI and what to do with the bias in algorithms, the future of robots and, you know, what's going to happen to the people, the future of energy, the, you know, the future of information and the future of food. And we're looking at how we have to shut down uh, production of uh, meat-based diets and go to plant uh, foods. And so we hope that these little companies doing this will be militantly profitable. <laughs> um, get rid of all the labels. You know, if they are honestly producing the goods and services that we need for the solar age, and we're shifting the assets from the dead fossilized sectors of the 20th century, why not? So I, I'm about reforming markets because what I know is that markets cannot exist without ethics and trust and fidelity and contractual relations and without being based on science. Mm -hmm. No more magical thinking based on money. Right. <clears throat> and I think going along with that is it's important to think about changing the, the values that are prioritized in our culture so that that can prompt people to instead of saying greed is good and I'm not going to consider the consequences for others with what I'm doing if people start to develop the kind of we consciousness that we're talking about where you do consider uh, that you're part of a, a giant interdependent system of interconnection with all the entire web, web of life exactly then, yes and um so and this is the true science. You know, I did a paper with my friend Fritjof Capra, the physicist, mm 
Yeah. Uh, we did it together in, in 2009 uh, called Qualitative Growth. And we were saying, you know, um, it's not about no growth. You know, human beings um, are developing and evolving all the time. But it's, it's qualitative. Um, not to do with quantity. And his book, The Systems View of Life, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, I did a review of, um, you know, basically, um, this is the scientific model. And the economy, once our finance and our economies operate on nature's principles, like the Biomimicry Institute, if you go to biomimicry.org, they're, they're also partners of ours. Um, they say they help companies, they go into companies and teach companies applied biology. And they'll say, okay, you're going to have to shut down this company, this, this whole production line is unsustainable, you're going to have to shut it down. And here's three or four products that you're going to have to retire. And here's a way we can redesign this product and this product to be sustainable and to, to run on nature's principles. But they, they, they work with cities, helping cities with public transportation and all of this sort of thing based on electric you know, vehicles. And so basically, this is going on at all of the system levels. We are learning as in families and individuals, um, and we are learning as communities in our local groups. We are learning uh, at city, the city level. We are learning at the national level. And we are learning now, thanks to the sustainable development goals, we now have a set of goals that are based on science, not on money. Right. See, GDP was all about money. So we go from the GDP to the SDGs. And we have a TV program I just did about two months ago with a former financial uh, asset manager called Steering Our Societies from GDP to SDGs. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> so, we can uh, do it. yeah, that, that's great. So, um, as we wind up, let's uh, remind people how they can get involved with all of these projects. Um, why don't, why don't you go first, Hazel, and how can people connect with uh, ethical markets and, and support your efforts? Well, we are, a, um, we are a B corporation, which says that we're not trying to take, we're not really a philanthropy. Actually, I fund it with my royalties from my books and my lectures and my TV shows. You know. so, so you're part of the love economy. You're part of the love economy, right? That's right, that's right. And I'll go on doing that as long as I can, you know, out of my own pocket if I have to. But basically, um, they can go to our partners page. They go on the site, go to ethicalmarkets.com, and you can go to our partners section, and you can check out all of these different partners that we have. You know, the Schumacher Society, so they, uh, or you can go to the ethicalmarkets.tv, click on that, um, watch the program called The Money Fix, um, which will lead you to all of the local economy experiments and how people are doing this all over the world. Um, we have um, a, uh, we give an award um, to media because remember, we all live today in mediocracies. <laughs> it doesn't matter what form of government you think you live under. We're all mediocracies now, and the new economies are attention economies. It's all about eyeballs, and that's why we're needing to reform uh, Facebook and Google and uh, Amazon and all of those companies who are becoming new monopolies based on advertising, which is holding us back. Wow. It's, it's advertising, which is unsustainable, wow. and they're going to have to get off that advertising model. Um, and if they're going to be the real public square that we need, I've got a couple of articles about the new models, which can also be in the private sector, and some of them will make money and some of them will be run by local governments. There's no reason why cities 
and local governments can't run a social media platform for their citizens, just like they run the local park and pick up the garbage. Um, it'll be very cheap because they're capital light and it can be run out of the local taxpayer property taxes. And That's a great idea. And basically, um, we can have here in St. Augustine, Florida, we'll have the St. Augustine social media platform, no advertising allowed, just people talking to each other and community activities. And, uh, you know, they can, they can talk about, um, okay, we have solar energy companies now in St. Augustine. Um, we have uh, all kinds of, of uh, advanced companies that can help people um, with making their homes more efficient, um, you know, putting on uh, like uh, in, in, uh, in our, we live in a hundred year old house, which um, uh, we put all um, LA, uh, actually we put compact fluorescent lighting into this house 20 years ago, and now we've shifted all of it to LEDs which is the next, the better than compact fluorescence. And we have put a white roof on. You see, if everybody put a white roof on their house, um, this would cool the planet because it reflects the sun's rays. Um, and that's what's really happening uh, in the uh, melting of the ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic, is as the ice melts, more and more um, of the sunlight is absorbed into the ocean, which looks dark. Whereas in the old days, it was thrown back by the, uh, the white of the, the white uh, of the ice. Exactly. Yes. You know, I want to pick up on what you were saying about municipalities. Um, there are some municipalities around the United States and probably other parts of the world that have taken control of the entire uh, high speed internet um implementation so uh and i forget the name of that there's one on the east coast i forget where where it is but um it's it offers for free for the entire for the all the residents in this and it's a major um city they offer high speed internet that's faster than um the the, the normal internet yeah. that, that everybody else has and they could do your idea of of having the uh, municipally run uh, social, social media from that platforms. One. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the first city that did that um, was Chattanooga. That's Chattanooga. it. That's the one. That's right. what I was thinking of. And you see, the model of Chattanooga um, right. is the way to go to provide internet. You see, um, it should be municipally owned internet, just the way we have municipally owned electricity. Yeah, that makes the, sense. The co-ops, you see, most of our, a lot of our electricity in this country is still provided by co-ops, you see? And so we can have, uh, the, in fact, in Gainesville, Florida, um, where the electricity is provided by a city-owned cooperative, um, you know, a company, uh, that's where you get your electricity, um, they just overlaid the internet. And so they, pro they own the internet connections and provide people with broadband. Why not? They're just on the same platform, you see. And so Silicon Valley, unfortunately, got greedy. And they got all um, sort of uh, tied up with the Wall Street model, you know, that they really believed in the money game. And um, they are having their comeuppance now. And I, I held a conference here with one of our partners, which is the World Academy of Art and Science, which is another um, of these global uh, networks, you know, mostly professors and scientists. And, but we had a conference here last year um, on the future of democracy. And I wrote a paper for that, which is on our website, called The Future of Democracy Challenged in the Digital Age. And I'm talking about algorithms where you have bias in and bias out. It used to be that computer people would say garbage in, garbage out. With algorithms, it's bias in, bias out. That's right. And we've got to watch that, you know? And so um, I was- but That has to do with diversity also uh, of 
uh, people in the area of, of programming. Uh, if you don't have a diverse set of programmers, oh, yeah. then th th that's where the bias in comes from. Yes, exactly. Well, you know, there was a quote, um, uh, a famous quote used to be uh, that uh, if I can create, um, um, if I can control the way money is created, I don't care who runs the government. And then uh, Paul Samuelson, the economist for MIT, said, I, I care not who creates the laws uh, as long as we can control the economic textbooks. Uh-huh. You see? Yeah. So now, if we don't control the coders, the coders will control us. And that's where AI, that whole conversation comes in. That's it. That's it. So the New Economics Foundation, I posted a very good report of this on accountability for AI. See, an AI is just an advertising slogan. There's no such thing as artificial intelligence. What it is, is human trained machine learning. And what's been happening is like a human being who spent their life learning to be a translator for the UN or something like that, um, they have been in a situation where they've had to teach a machine to do that translation, and then the machine takes their job. Exactly. It's, it's always a question. It's, it's not about these words like communism or capitalism or you know that 19th century stuff. It's who owns the platform. That's all you need to know. Who owns the platform? I'll help and, straighten things out. And could it be we yes. that own the platform? So that's the whole point. You see, if communities own the platform, uh, we're fine. See, in Gainesville, Florida, um, mm -hmm. the community owns the electricity platform and the internet platform. So it can be um, publicly discussed at the city commission and the county commission. Incredible. And this is where Karen's work is so important. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. So, so uh, thank you for letting people know how they can connect with you, Hazel. Do you want to do that, uh, Karen, and then I'll do it. Okay, yeah, you can connect with me at globalkindnesstv.org. You can also follow on social media, Mindful Media Mom, and um, you can email me directly at karenpalmer at wetheworld.org. You can also follow us on Facebook as The We Campaign, and you can also follow us on Twitter as The We Campaign. Exactly, and if people would like to join the WE campaign and get involved with WE the World, uh, you can go to the easiest web address to remember on the planet, we.net, the wow. network of WE. So right on the homepage, you can sign up to join the WE team and become a WE campaign coordinator uh, and volunteer. Uh, you can sign up your organization to uh, participate in one of the 11 campaigns for change, uh, of which economic justice is one, which we're talking about today. And um, there's also the Global Unity Calendar, which is a free public international calendar uh, that is a, a wonderful resource for organizations and socially conscious businesses to post their upcoming events and annou announcements. And when you post on our calendar, it's unique in the sense that it's synchronized with other organizations calendars as well. So you post on our calendar, and it shows up on multiple websites around the world. So, um, so thank you uh, for an incredible conversation about the uh, current and future of our economy and our society in general, Hazel Henderson. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this so much, Rick. And thank you for all your incredibly good work. And Karen also. It was wonderful uh, being on with you both. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, so why don't we end with our, our quote from our dear friend Jonathan Granoff, who was at the, uh, the launch of the WE campaign and WE.net 
about 10 years ago. And the last thing he said was, I hope that we expand so much that there's no longer any them. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stay tuned. We have some amazing people coming up the rest of the week. And we've got lots of great things happening for these 11 days of global unity. Um, and let us know what you're doing. Type into the chat what you're doing and um, check out our calendar at globalunitycalendar.org. Thanks everybody so much and make sure you share this broadcast with all of your loved ones, your family, your friends, and um, let's all just remember, let's go from that me society to we society. With the three eyes that make a we, inspire, inform, and involve. Hello. Three eyes that take us from a me society to a we society. We society. We get it. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.